Aloha and welcome to another episode of Hawaii Food and Farmers Series, where we're meeting with Hawaii's farmers, foodies, and people who just care about our local food system. Um, as always, not always, but most of the time, uh, I'm your co-host, Matt Johnson, here with mm. Justine Espiritu. Oh, Say hi, Justine. Uh, hello. Um, as always, you can join the conversation, and we hope you do. Uh, you can tweet, if you're into tweeting, uh, at ThinkTechHI. And you can actually call in the hotline. We're really hoping for some, for some phone calls today. And the number listed right at the screen <laughs> below, 415-871-2474. Uh, and also, too, you can check out the show later on YouTube, uh, at ThinkTechHI, ThinkTechHawaii, YouTube. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> there it is at the bottom of the screen. Thank you, Zuri. So, uh, Justine, why don't you go ahead and introduce our guest today? Awesome. Thanks, Matt. So, today is going to be a little different. We're not really going to call it an interview. We're going to call it just a, a conversation. Oh, wow. We have I, I did not know about that. <laughs> we have two guests from the University of Hawaii, from the Department of Geography. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm just going to call them Mary M., who is the <laughs> assistant professor, and we have Eli L., who who is an undergraduate student with the Department of Geography. And so you guys are working together right now on some interesting research and looking into some things that are going on in our local food system, particularly how folks are getting involved, why that's important, and kind of the role that plays in um, food production here in Hawaii. So if we can start off with um, kind of making that connection between geography and your interest in the food system, if we want to start with that. Sure. Mary. Yeah. Mary, yeah. You... So that's a really interesting question. I think geography is a very broad discipline, and for human geographers especially, we're very interested in looking at the relationship between humans and their environment. So of course, agricultural and food plays a huge role in our environment and the way that um, we that place is produced and place making practices. So a lot of geographers, including Eli as an undergraduate student and myself and also our colleague, Chris Nesser Yunata, um, is engaged in looking at how people, um, how people engage with food and also looking at agriculture and the various uh, ways in which agriculture affects our lives. So we look at it from a political perspective, an economic perspective, a social and a cultural perspective as well as an environmental perspective. Mm -hmm. And that, that's really interesting to me because I think a lot of people, well, not me, but <laughs> think of geography as like, oh, you do GIS? And so when you talk about human geography, um, I mean, maybe kind of like, you know, you gave a great description on that. So in terms of like local agriculture, what are you guys looking at and, and seeing? Or what what has what your, been your focus with that? Yeah, so one of our projects that we're working on now is looking at the various ways that people value agricultural and food events in Hawaii. And what we see is that there's a growing interest and excitement around food and agriculture. And so people are really excited to go volunteer on farms. They're excited to do woofing, which is also known as the Willy, uh, worldwide opportunities on organic farms. People are doing meditation on farms, yoga retreats, um, and various other kinds of activities. And we're interested in knowing where is this excitement coming from and what role does it play in the way people value um, agriculture as well as the viability of agriculture in the state. I, I think that's an interesting point. When we talk about these kind of events that are going on, I think with, with farms we've talked about and in terms of that viability, I think there's been a message that farms have to kind of embrace this idea of the community being involved to kind of proliferate that image and get the excitement of supporting mm. local farmers. And it's it's aside from just focusing on production, mm -hmm. that engagement is really important in terms of their viability as a, as a business or a revenue stream. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, actually. And what we found is that a lot of small farms, especially, that most of their revenue, or more than 50%, actually comes from these alternative revenue streams. So for example, having different kinds of events or having farm fairs or these kinds of things uh, make up a huge percentage of their revenue. Also, federal grants for various kinds of um, youth training programs or various kinds of community development programs. So it's an important way that people are both supplementing their, uh, their revenue as well as um, creating community through um, food and agriculture programs and events. 
And additionally, like when people um, go to these events, right? They go to like um, do yoga on a farm or mm. go to a music event on a farm. It also gets them interested in, in agriculture, right? It gets them mm. interested in. Mm. It, it educates them a little bit as well because they learn a little bit more about the process and about foods. And then, like myself, like I went to a couple events on farms, and then I was like, this looks really cool. Maybe I want to volunteer, get more involved. So it kind of creates that awareness as well. So, so with the so you guys are kind of seeing this trend, but what what are you? I mean, guess what what kind of results or what kind of things are you seeing? So there's definitely an interest uh, in these small uh, agri food initiatives, and they're they're adding on, like you said, um, other I guess non farming activities on the farm that are a huge portion of their uh, revenue. Mm -hmm. So what what kind of I mean, what kind of conclusions, or, or what what are you seeing? Like, what what does this all, I guess, mean? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, I think it's really important to think about the what we call the performative value of these kinds of events. So rather than the economic value, the value that they play in re-articulating the discourse around food and agriculture and the significance of that for um, garnering support for things like local agriculture. So for small farmers in Hawaii that depend on people valuing local agriculture, you have to develop that value, right? That's a mm -hmm. cultural um, that's cultural, and so to um, for people, it's a it contribute. You need it's part of social change, and social change is oftentimes very slow. So it's all of these things combined. You know, it's the bumper sticker that says "Know Your Farmer," right? Or it's the um, who may you know, be your yogi at the same time. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's all of these things sort of combined. It's more like a, a theoretical speak, you might talk about like the assemblage components of this broader um, this broader articulation of what is food and agriculture, why do we why do we value it, what is the significance of valuing it, and why is it important. And so all of these things play a huge role in supporting um, local food and agriculture in the state. So despite the fact that it's actually a very small percentage of the economy, um, it does play a huge role in creating the space for broader structural changes and policy changes that we need to um, contribute to the growth of um, local food. So, so in your research, what are what are the kind of things you've checked out that you've seen uh, specifically? What farms are are doing? What have you checked out? Specifically about farms, I mean, uh, you guys had Sean Anderson on the show from Green mm. Rose Farms, yeah. who does like stuff with Yo Garden and, and mm -hmm. music events, so um, that was where I volunteered once as well, actually, because like the environment there was really enjoyable, I really enjoyed being there. Um, uh, what else? Um, and you, so you guys checked out a couple woofer farms? Sure. Yeah, Mary did a lot of work with Woofing Farms. So what, what, what is Woofing again for any of our viewers <laughs> that may not be familiar with it? Uh, it's, it's an acronym that stands for Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms, and it's actually a world, so it's a worldwide program and people do it. Um, it's an opportunity for people to volunteer on farms for usually around four hours per day in exchange for accommodation. Um, and there are more than 300 Woofing Farms in Hawaii alone. Um, and so it's an important way that especially smart small farmers are able to offset the cost of labor um, as well as create these sort of unique creative opportunities for people to um, to learn about organic agriculture and create new forms of community mm -hmm. you know and, and one of the things I talked about before specifically with Hawaii being in an island I think there's been particular emphasis to kind of experience Hawaii or get get a connection or a sense of community through food, that we've seen volunteering at farms or living on a woofer property has been this kind of gateway to experience a more authentic um, experience with Hawaii. I think specifically with tourism being such our, our dominant economy, like this is a way that um, agriculture can kind of insert itself into kind of compete in that economy in a way to kind of give that alternative experience. And I think for Hawaii that's particularly unique with the with the incorporating the food system into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that there's like definitely a strong connection between people seeking sort of authentic tourism experiences. So a lot of woofers are like, we want to get to, they're motiv motivated by the idea of having an authentic Hawaii experience. And so part of that is getting to know people in the community as well as sort of getting their hands dirty um, and get, staying at it for a longer period of time. And that's not exactly unique to Hawaii. If you, around the world, um, I've done, I lived and worked in New Zealand for a while and 
woofing is a huge part of um, the agriculture um, system there, where you have a lot of people who will travel for up to even a year or longer, um, just going around the country or around a region, um, part volunteering on farms. And they see this as a way to have a more authentic uh, tourism experience um, and I think that's not unrelated to people's desire to have more sort of authentic connection with their food um, so we can see this for example when you um, see like fair trade products and you'll see a picture of the farmer and they'll say meet farmer Joe who grew your coffee right this is sort of one way where people seek out this intimacy with food and agriculture and they, they're also seeking out a sort of a more authentic experience. So authenticity I think is an important discourse to think about when we're thinking about the way people value these mm. kinds of systems. Um, so kind of taking like these, these individual, I guess, farm experiences and um, you know, some of the successes that you're seeing, are you guys seeing this as a trend that could, uh, at a larger scale for the entire state, um, help when we're talking about food security for the state or increasing the amount of uh, locally grown foods is this um i guess a trend or even like a recommendation like are you guys kind of trying to develop some kind of a model that that you could see working to make hawaii move more food self-secure I mean, one of the things that we do look at um, with these agri-food initiatives is, is what's the, the viability of, of mm -hmm. these small farms, right? Um, so as Mary mentioned earlier, like a lot of the revenue generated comes from um, not necessarily the produce, although the produce is obviously a big part mm -hmm. of it, but from events as well. Um, so if you're trying to figure out what the viability is and you can kind of put your thumb on it essentially, then that come, becomes a blueprint for other small farms that might want to start up as well so they can invest in like agro-tourism, right, or farm tours or events, like they can have that in mind as they work. Um, I think that's definitely like part of that. Yeah. Okay. I, oh, oh, go ahead. And another big part of that, especially in Hawaii, is like agriculture. The sort of vision of agriculture is important for the marketing of place, right? So mm, this yeah. is obviously a tourist economy, tourism um, economy, and so it's important to keep that sort of vision of Hawaii. You don't want to not have any agricultural land in Hawaii, for example. So it's not just agriculture itself, but it's the tourism economy, and it plays into other industries as well. Um, and so agro-tourism in particular is an important way that people, that farmers in Hawaii are off, offsetting um, sometimes declining revenue through farming itself. It's a way to create sort of value-added, place-based marketing. Yeah, so we're gonna take a quick 60 second break and then we're gonna get back to it because I'm curious of what that kind of balance is maybe between focusing on production or trying to build up this other side of it. So we'll take a quick break and get back into it. I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., you'll have a chance to come and listen and learn from scientists around the world. Scientists who talk about their work in meaningful, easy to understand ways. And you'll come to appreciate science as a wonderful way of thinking, way of knowing about the world. You'll learn interesting facts, interesting ideas. You'll be stimulated to think more. Please come join us every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii for a likable science with me, your host, Ethan Allen. Aloha kako. I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to navigate the journey with us. We are here every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m., and we really want you to be with us where we look at the options and choices of end-of-life care. Aloha. Food Informer series. I'm your co-host Matt Johnson here with Justine Espirito. And Justine, who do we have with us today? We have Mary M. And you don't Eli. Even want to try the last <laughs> don't want to waste time. Don't want to waste time. Don't want to waste oh, time. Oh, okay. Eli L. from the Department of Geography at UH, um, doing some interesting research and analysis on agro-food initiatives or food events. Things that are that are cultivating kind of a sense of a community between consumers and farmers. And we're kind of talking about that that balance of 
of where that gets us or how um, that contributes to the viability of small farms. And so I'm, I'm wondering when we're talking about small farms that really represent this kind of local identity um, and representation of Hawaii and how much effort they need to, to put into these kind of events versus maybe the focus on production itself. Um, one of the things, the interesting things that I've learned from talking to farmers and working with farmers is they're, they're a little bit isolated and we talk about how they, there's so many skills they need to have and they're producing their product, they have to market it. And I think this idea of putting on these initiatives, um, thats it's a very conscious effort you have to take and not everyone is able to do that. If, maybe that's a, a question I have of, um, are there farms that are doing this and farms that aren't? And kind of that, what's that different capacity? You know, when we talk about Kahumana or Green Rose, those are farms that really are, are a, it's kept alive by a community. Right. And maybe farms, like family farms, like Ho Farms, I think is maybe just getting into it because mm -hmm. that's a smaller family thing. If you kind of want to touch on that. Here's a, yeah. this is from a Green Rose, right? Yeah, no, it looks like it, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that real that question really um, it really comes a lot of that uh, a lot of the differences are around labor issues, right? So for when a lot of farms try to scale up, that becomes a sort of bottleneck in which it's sort of the, the either things um, either far, that becomes the issue that a lot of farmers deal with. So when people try to scale up, they have to start increasing their, the cost. And when you have to increase costs for labor, if you don't have family to help out on the mm -hmm. farm, then um, you're going to be hiring people for around $12 an hour is around about the going rate. And so this becomes a, the, one of the big differences between farms that don't pay that don't pay directly for labor or who have subsidized labor versus other kinds of other types of farms. Um, and that what is one of the big differences between Hawaii and the US mainland. So for example, on the US mainland, around 50 to um, Seventy percent of agricultural laborers are um, uh, undocumented workers. Fifty wow. to seventy percent. Um, yeah, so it's unclear the exact statistic because of the illegality of it, but it's around fifty to seventy percent. And so when you look at Hawaii, where we don't have. Um, that many undocumented workers in the same way that maybe California might, um, we pay a lot more for labor. And so that is what makes the um, production, that's one of the reasons production in Hawaii is um, significantly higher. And one of the reasons why, if we want to increase local food production, we also need to increase local food consumption. Mm -hmm. And so that's where these kinds of events really play a huge role. And Just like drumming up that demand for it. Right, absolutely. You have to create the demand, right? So it's a cult again, it's like a cultural shift. Um, and so that's why these events are important in creating the demand and creating the consumption. And that will play a huge role in farmers' ability to scale up. Um, so you think farms that don't engage in these kind of activities, these kind of events, are they putting themselves at a disadvantage if they don't put resources and um, brainstorming into, into doing these kind of things? Well, I guess not necessarily, right? Um, like you mentioned, Ho Farms earlier, like they're doing quite well, you know, and they have um, they have a very successful, like you know, means of, of producing and selling their product, right? So it's not necessary behind it, um, but that depends on that depends on the model, right? That depends on what system you have. If you have like a real um, like a value-added product, a real niche product mm. that fits into a market really mm. well, you might not necessarily need to do like these kinds of events and initiatives. So it depends. Oh, on okay, the that's that's interesting. And I, th I mean, I think the, what's most interesting to me is that there are so many different types of models where I think like back in the day, um, and which is changing, as people think about, oh, going into farming, you're just thinking about going and working in the dirt and and just mm -hmm. pulling weeds, and which is definitely still and always going to be part of agriculture. But it sounds like what you guys are seeing, the trends are, is that there's different ways to do it where you don't have to just go in and be uh, you know, hardcore production type farm. I mean, need still need to have those kind of farms and you're going to have those farms, which is good, but there's more diversity. Also too with the types of technology that's available, so like aquaponics mm. is becoming super popular, which is also creating other I guess revenue streams for the aquaponic farms because there's so much interest in it. So people are coming in doing tours. I know Mari's Garden just started doing yoga as well. Seems like no. yoga is like the, <laughs> the next hot thing. I was talking to the farm manager who's like the last person who I would ever expect to be interested in yoga, but they're smart. They're entrepreneurs and they're mm. you know finding opportunities and 
uh, also working with like Nika Calderi, they started doing on-farm tours mm -hmm. and they realized that they're able to do that instead of actually going to the farmers markets. Mm -hmm. um, and, and farmers markets are, are a great outlet for products but also um, can be very time consuming, mm -hmm. costly, and mm -hmm. it's a hard thing to do. So that was an interesting shift for Nika Calderi, where for the longest time they're like, gotta go to the farmer's market, gotta go to the farmer's market, and now they get to stay on the farm and a large part of their customers are, are coming to them. Sure. It's not really a question. Because <laughs> 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 it's a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a conversation. <laughs> conversation. Yeah, so why don't you lead us into a, a question? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> What's on that list there? So, okay, looking again at, at whooping, uh, when we talk about the, the disadvantages to labor costs in Hawaii, is that I've always, is, is whooping then kind of controversial in that sense of capitalizing on free labor? Yeah, I mean, if you talk to farmers, especially small farmers that have woofers, um, there, and then talk to farmers that don't, ho small farmers that don't host woofers. Of course, there's an unfair um, advantage, right? So, what you're doing is, if you have a, a farmer that hosts woofers and they don't pay for labor, they're going to be, be, they're going to be able to sell their produce, at, for example, the farmers market for cheaper than farmers that pay for their labor, right? So that is definitely a tension that we've heard some about um, from farmers and. Yeah, I think that's an ongoing discussion ar among um, farmers in Hawaii. Although there, there is some difficulty there with woofing, um, we've seen before with woofers don't typically have lots of experience in farming, right? Mm, so they're more yeah. to like make mistakes or yeah. maybe um, it's a little bit slower production, right? Because they're not entirely sure. They have to be trained on the job. So yeah. obviously that takes like effort and hours mm. from a manager, from whoever. Well, that's what I thought. There's a little bit of like a sacrifice Absolutely. in the level of production. My right. experience with um, volunteering with farms, they have to, you know, they've got their routine and their system and, and that whole idea of trying to bring the public into, you know, yeah. they have to paint it in a certain way. They can only do so mm. much. And so there really seems to be that balance of, of how much do we bring these community helpers <laughs> in to help. <laughs> and um, so I'm always interested in how farmers balance balance that. Because I know, like, yeah, Kahomana, for the longest time, they had a large woofing program. I think they decided to scale back just for the, kind of the reason that you were describing, where they're actually starting to produce more. And I think they've mm -hmm. gotten to a point where they still have woofing program, but, you know, there are, you know, setbacks to that as well. And yeah. they also have, like, the apprenticeship as well, mm -hmm. so they have people yeah. on for longer periods of time. So it's kind of a similar idea where you take someone who's, who's maybe newer to agriculture, doesn't know as much, but then you give them the time to, you know, to learn and to, like, become part of the whole, um, the whole system they have up as well yeah. and it's, it's far more reliable as well if you have someone on for like a set period of time yeah. too mm -hmm. yeah what we see is that a lot of people a lot of farmers that host swiffers they if they're scaling up they ultimately will scale up slowly into some sort of internship program um, so they have more of a commitment because there is a huge opportunity cost if you're spending all your time training people right. to pick weeds or um, different kinds of um, techniques mm -hmm. how about with um, ag tourism um, I mean, I think there's uh, a lot of potential around that. What, what models have you seen that you feel are working really well or that you've been impressed with? I think that there are, are tons of opportunities for ag tourism in Hawaii. It's one way that tourists like to, again, it comes back to this sort of seeking out an authentic Hawaii experience. And agriculture really can play a huge role in that in terms of people saying, oh, I want to go, you know, uh, have lunch on a farm and we're yeah. going to go meet people and have a tour. And um, we met this tour guide and he's from Hawaii and he told me all about the community. These kinds of things, these intimate encounters are really important for people who are seeking these kinds kinds of experiences, which there's quite a huge market for, definitely. Um, and we definitely see that also with farmers markets, right? So like mm -hmm. the KCC market, mm -hmm. I don't know the numbers, but I would say a high percentage of the people at the KCC market are actually tourists, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so they're coming for some of the prepared food, but also to get a sort of local flavor of mm -hmm. Hawaii. So they'll buy some of the prepared food, bring it home, and there's this sort of value-added place-based marketing around sort of like local Hawaii honey, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah. Yeah. I think I see a lot of that success too with um, 
the integration even with with locals like the idea of these dinners these farm to table dinners mm. I know a particular mushroom farm that throws awesome parties <laughs> <laughs> and that idea you know even to give you that advantage you know when you're, you're at the grocery store it's like oh I know Yang <laughs> like yeah. yeah I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna take those really kind of yeah um, shaking that barrier between um, consumers and farmers and so some of your your research as well goes into why kind of farmers uh, get into this or kind of take this on? Is that true? Kind of looking into their their motivation with this kind of like changing landscape of, of the viability. So can you share a little bit about what you've what you've heard from farmers on that? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, so, or, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we're, really, we're interested in looking at what motivates, especially new farmers in Hawaii. And this is really interesting mm. given there's a lot of, um, a lot of initiatives to, um, to encourage people to become farmers in the state. And so there's these sort of new, tra new farmer training programs. Um, and a lot of people that enter these programs, a lot of them are very young um, and really interested in sort of uh, in these kinds of experiences, as well as people that are retired or looking for second careers. And so um, oftentimes what, what we often hear is that people are valuing these types of experiences for way more than the sort of the economic part, um, aspects to it. So they're not trying to go into it to make a lot of money. Rather, they're trying to go into farming because they value it for other reasons. So the community they build around farming um, as well as contributing to the production of local um, food and other reasons why people, and also the lifestyle, right? So with new farmers, the other the other group of large group of new farmers and even larger than the sort of um uh, than farmers that go through a lot of these training programs are new are new immigrants so you have farmers from for example Laos and Thailand um, that are coming to that are farming in Hawaii and so there's um, good thing they're not on the president's ban list <laughs> right yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean that's a big issue right that's another show <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so there are various ways that new farmers are valuing farming in Hawaii. Some farmers va are valuing it for the lifestyle that it offers, while others, for example, new immigrants, oftentimes are valuing it for the livelihood that it offers. So this is sort of this, um, the lifestyle and livelihoods um, is an interesting way to think about the various ways people can value farming. Like so we have 20 seconds left. Oh, Hawaii so, farmers. <laughs> awesome, yeah, definitely. Don't cut me off. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming on and sharing Thanks. some your research yeah, and having this fun. conversation with us. Great conversation. <laughs> we're, we're out of time. All right. <laughs>